Turn with me to Matthew 28. As we look at the scriptural story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he has gone ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were doing what they were told, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests what had happened. Now I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 16, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you to Galilee, where you will see him. And just as he had told you, they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And then finally, I'd like you to turn to John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. And saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, John, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And so Peter, with the other disciple, went forth, and they were going to the tomb. Now the two of them were running together, and the other disciple, John, ran ahead faster than Peter, and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrapping lying there, and he did not go in. And so Peter came, and also following him, and entered into the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And so the other disciple, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And so the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, 
where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Let's pray. Oh, Father, for three long days, your precious Son, the Prince of Life, lay dead in the grave. And all seemed lost to those closest to him. No light, no hope. What a Sabbath day it must have been for them. A day they once shared with their master, now he was gone. Once he broke bread with them, and now he lay broken. Once he shared wine with them, and now his blood was poured out. And he lay in the grave. But it is not so. An earthquake, an angel, the women, and those blessed words, he is not here, he is risen. He's risen from the dead. He's risen with healing in his wings. Death could not hold him. The grave had no power over him. You are greater than death, greater than the grave, Jesus. You are the prince of life and life eternal for all who believe. And as a flame dispels darkness, your resurrection dispels death forevermore. And so we're filled with fear and great joy like those women of old. Fear at trying to comprehend what it all means. And great joy at the staggering truth that you are alive. You are truly alive. Living forevermore and never more to die. And because you live, we have life too. Because you died, we will never see death. Because you have new life, we have put away our sin. Because you are victorious, our battle is won. And because you have risen from the dead, we stand justified, O oh Lord. Our minds cannot comprehend these things. Our hearts overflow with feelings that we cannot get a hold of. Our eyes look at the words in the Bible and blur over with tears. Our lips repeat what is written, but they also break out in praise. Our ears hear the message declared, He is risen, and hope rises in our souls that cannot be quieted. But we confess, we cannot fully comprehend what all of this means, and we'll not fully understand until we see you face to face. And then we will know all you have done in your resurrection the resurrection we celebrate today on Resurrection Sunday. You have risen. You have risen indeed. And though words fail us, praise continues to flow out from us because our praise is by your Holy Spirit who groans too deep for words to express. And so we thank you, Jesus. We lift up your holy name and we extol you today. And we anxiously await for you to return. May it be soon, we pray. For we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Maybe the resurrection of Jesus has lost much of its impact on a jaded modern world. A world so consumed with self. Maybe they consider themselves too intellectual too scientifically informed to believe such a myth as a bodily resurrection by a man 2,000 years ago. There are even those who follow religion that take the resurrection of Jesus Christ and they make it into a mere spiritual phenomena. 
something that they say we can glean a spiritual or moral lesson from, but they certainly don't take the actual historical event into, into consideration. Now, that would take a little bit too much for them to believe. And yet, devout Christians the world over continue to celebrate this day, Resurrection Sunday, an ongoing witness of God's message to a watching world. And if you've tuned into the TV channels at all today, you'll see many are lauding Resurrection Sunday. Many are looking for hope today. It's a message that says that Jesus Christ literally died on the cross for the sins of mankind and that his death was received by God the Father as a satisfactory payment for sin and therefore it allowed him to provide the full forgiveness of sins to all who repent and believe. It's based on the death of his son. And sound Christian biblical doctrines teaches the verification or stamp of approval from God the Father that was the literal and historical physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the death. It was him saying, enough, it is enough. You have won victory. <laughs> All over the world today, preachers are going to preach and have preached on the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to millions of people who truly believe this event to have taken place in real time and history. We are ones who believe that at Beacon of Hope. And in this day of COVID fear, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is God's special promise of our hope for immortality. It is the bedrock foundation of the Christian faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is evidence that his atoning work on the cross was received by the Father as both complete and acceptable or satisfactory. And therefore, the death and the resurrection are related to one another as that of service and reward or could be seen as cause and effect. Jesus died and his death was sufficient to pay for sin. And in recognition of that fact, Jesus rose from the dead. We believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christians have affirmed that belief through the Apostles' Creed for millennia. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell or to the dead. And on the third day, he rose again. On the third day, he rose again. The apostles proclaimed this message as the core of the gospel, the good news that they preached throughout the world at that time. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. They carried the message of redemption as it's established in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is the same message that we must continue to bring forth in every generation because it is in the hope of the resurrection that we have hope of eternal life. And it's a message to the nations. It's universal. You know, I've been thinking, uh, a friend of mine mentioned that Jesus has shut the doors to churches across the globe. Maybe he wants us to get out and preach. Maybe he wants to break us out of these four walls and bring us into a more vital witnessing opportunity. Most theology books will tell you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, first, supremely important because it is a validation of the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 15 referred to as the resurrection chapter. And verse 17 says this, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you're still in your sins. The resurrection is very important. Secondly, it's a guarantee of the Father's acceptance of the Son's work. Because we read, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, a satisfaction for our sins, and not 
only ours, but also for those of the whole world. It is a worldwide message, just like COVID is worldwide virus. The resurrection is the Father's voice much louder than, than at Jesus' baptism where he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's louder than at the Mount of Tri- uh, Transfiguration where he said, this is my Son. Do as he says. Follow him. Here, God shouts his approval of Christ with the resurrection. Thirdly, it's the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, isn't it? David spoke of Messiah's resurrection in Psalm 16, prophesying Messiah's words, his very words, quote, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, the grave. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. And that's how both Peter and Paul in the book of Acts preached. They reasoned that the psalm, Psalm 16, is a reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in their sermons. Listen to just a couple of words uh, first from Peter. But God raised him up, talking of Jesus to the Jews, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him, Jesus, to be held in its power. For David says of him, now he goes to the psalm, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Why? David said this, mimicking the words of Jesus Christ, which would be spoken. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And then Paul, when he preached in Acts, he said this, but God raised him from the dead. Raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. The very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. These are Paul's words. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised Jesus. As is also written in the second psalm, you are my son today, I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, quote, I will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. He went back to Psalm 16. And Paul goes on to reason that David died and was buried and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, Paul said, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. (laughs) They preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection, fourthly, is our assurance of eternal life. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's in Roman, uh, 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. The resurrection is extremely important. And I'm so glad that we get to celebrate it today. And, you know, even though we're celebrating it in a unique way, we are still together, people. Our hearts are together. 2 Timothy 2.8 says it so succinctly. Paul, reminding his son in the faith, he said this to him, Remember, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Period. <laughs> Remember, Timothy, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Now, why did he do that? Why did Paul tell Timothy to do that? Well, it was his son in the faith, and Paul was writing from prison. And I think Timothy was struggling with the fact that his father of the faith was in prison. He was also suffering persecution, and he wrote it to encourage him. And if ever... We need an encouragement. We need it in the midst of the terrible COVID fear that we're facing right now. So today, I'd like to take 
the remainder of our time to encourage you, each one of you, right where you are today, with the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you how the resurrection was physical. It was physical. It wasn't just a spiritualized thing for moral purposes to teach us a lesson. It was physical. Secondly, the resurrection brings hope. It truly does bring hope. And thirdly, it ensures our immortality. So I'm done with my little introduction and I'm moving into my sermon now. If you need to stand up and stretch, go ahead. But this is a, this is a glorious day and I hope your hearts are being encouraged right now. First, let's look at the fact that his resurrection was physical and not spiritual. What I mean is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was physical resurrection of Jesus' physical body. And it should not be spiritualized to make a moral point. His physical body that was beaten, bruised, scourged, hung on a cross to die, died. He died. He was taken down and he was placed into a tomb. He was buried. And on the third day, that body rose again, physically. Paul asks a question when addressing the matter of the resurrection bodies in 1 Corinthians 15, a great chapter. If you could read that uh, this afternoon with your family, that would be marvelous. He says this, Someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? He was interested in the body. That's in 1 Corinthians 15.35. Well, let me, let me tell you, Jesus' resurrection was the resurrection of his body. Number one, because there was an empty tomb with grave clothes folded up. No body. His body was missing. First Mary witnessed the body was gone. Then Peter and John... And then Mary returned to the empty tomb again, and Mary Magdalene clung to him. Obviously, as she's clinging to him, she's clinging to a body, a physical body. John 20, 17. And later that day, Jesus appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, one of my favorite stories, forever favorite, because Jesus takes them all the way back to Genesis and walks them through the Old Testament, Chronicles of Redemption, all the way And after they recognized that Jesus uh, was raised from the dead, they returned to Jerusalem to tell his disciples that they had seen the risen Christ, only to find them reporting that the Lord has already risen and appeared to Simon. So it was old news, but it was new news to them. To which the two who had met Jesus on the road to Emmaus began to relate their experience on the road and how he was recognized by them, in the breaking of the bread. And even as they were telling that story, if you look at the scriptural context, here these two are relaying their story of the road on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus appeared to them, and suddenly Jesus appears in their midst. And to his dear friends, the first thing he said was, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And as they continued to tremble at what was before their eyes, Jesus said to them, Here, touch me. See, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. They were practicing social distancing. They were freaked out. The one that they loved, the one who had died on the cross, and they knew to have been buried, was standing there. And they thought he was a spirit. And he says, No, come, come, come. Touch me and see, because the Spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And as they were still incredulous, Jesus asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Now, I don't think Jesus was hungry, but he was going to show them something. Do you have anything to eat here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Why? Because he was in a physical body, albeit glorified, but it was a physical body. It was a resurrection body. You find all this in Luke chapter 24, 39, and especially in verses 42 through 43. All this was to answer them that, had, that he had a physical body, a glorified one, but a physical body just the same. And Jesus repeated 
Jesus repeated to them the same thing with Thomas a week later, didn't he? You see, I'm, I'm really concerned for you, Beacon. This is, this is hard shepherding you from a distance. And I, I want to keep my finger on your pulse as you go through this COVID crisis. But whatever steals your peace is sin, people. Listen to me. We believers of all people should be the most calm, confident, quiet, trusting people on the earth right now. Because we have the answer to eternal life. The worst thing that can happen to us is we will die, which is the best thing that can happen to us. Now, take that at face value. We should not be frantic, fearful, chaotic, frenzy as we face the world and all that is going on in it today. Why? Because he is risen. Please don't let this be lost on you as you read the blogs and you read all the fearful things that people are proposing what might be. When they come, we will deal with them one at a time. Nothing has come yet except social distancing and doing church like this. And we'll start moving towards meeting together again. I believe it. I believe it. (laughs) Jesus repeated the fact that he was in a physical body to Thomas, didn't he? His resurrection was a resurrection of his physical body. He told Thomas, reach here your fingers, reach here your hand, and put it into my side, and Be not unbelieving, but believing. Now, we don't read that Thomas actually did that. It was enough. I think Thomas got the point because he he just fell down and all he could say was, my Lord and my God. So Jesus was seen by his immediate disciples at least three times in the first two weeks of his resurrection. Paul's apologetic for Jesus' resurrection focused on his body. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, we see first that this message that they preached, it is the gospel. I want you to turn there with me. 1 Corinthians 15, because I hope that you will read it for your family today. But let me just start in verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you. So Paul's talking about the gospel here. Which also you received in which you stand. And he's talking and addressing believers, the Corinthian believers. Verse 2. By which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Now verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was put to death. Verse 4, and that he was buried, that kind of cements the fact that he was put to death. He was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. goes on. And he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of them who remain now, and some have fallen asleep. Those people were still alive at Paul's time here, and he says you can go and talk to them. Over 500 people saw him, plus his own. But some of them have died. In verse 7, And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Wow. So Paul uses Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as the components of the gospel. Jesus was seen by Peter and then the twelve and also by over 500 brethren at once. That little he was seen is pointing to the fact that he had a physical body. It wasn't an aberration. The resurrection body of the believer will be physical, people. It will be physical. Further down in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul continues his defense of the resurrection as a physical bodily resurrection when he describes the kind of resurrection body believers will receive. Look down to verse 35. With what kind of body do they come? Verse 39. 
There's different kinds of flesh, Paul reasons, of men, beasts, birds, and fish. And there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. And there is the sun, the moon, the stars, and the stars all differ from one another. Verse 42, and the physical body is sown as a perishable body, one who is corrupt, but raised imperishable or incorruptible. Verse 42, sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. Sown in weakness, it's raised in power. And verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthy, meaning these mortal bodies, we will, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. What do we have to be sad about, people? What do we have to be gloomy about and fearful of? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> he is risen. So the resurrection was physical. Number one, because Jesus' physical body was raised. It wasn't in the tomb. Number two, it was vital to the gospel message and still is. That's what they included in the gospel message as they preached it in the first century. And number three, believers' bodies will be resurrected. We will enjoy a body just like Jesus's. Now my second point, his resurrection brings hope to the heart. If your heart's not pulsing with hope right now, keep listening. The disciples derived great hope from the resurrection. You can almost see the infusion of hope as one after the other brings news that they had seen Jesus. He is risen. He is alive. You know, at Gethsemane, we went through that when I preached on that. They all left him. They ran. Now, I believe that that wasn't just cowardice that was doing that. I believe Jesus gave them a way to run away so that they would not be arrested as well. That was in the sermon. But they did leave him alone, and he was alone. Peter and John watched him as he was scourged, and I believe John was there for the whole crucifixion. But for the most part, Jesus was alone, and the disciples were very, very fearful. Very fe fearful. They were human beings. They were men. They weren't some type of superheroes. And first, we see the women that came to the gravesite early morning, uh, Mary Magdalene probably just right at the crack of dawn, and, and then with the other women and so forth. But the women, from fear, phobos, to great joy, mega skara, grand, mega delight or gladness. Their hearts went from fear to mega joy. Why? Because they realized Jesus had raised from the dead. In Mark 16, 8, it shows that the women were trembling. Astonishment had gripped them. In a state of amazement, the Greek word is a compound word made up of ek, out, and stasis, ekstasis. Does it sound like anything? Ecstasy. Ekstasis. It means that, that they were outside of their normal standing. They were amazed they were in ecstasy over the fact that Jesus Christ had raised from the dead. And I think we would be as well. If he stood here right now before us, or right here next to me, you would be staggered, right? And here these three fearful, feeble people were, and Jesus is going, don't be afraid. I, it's real. I'm real. Touch me. You got anything to eat? I want you to understand I'm real. This happened just as I said it would. I'm sorry, that would make me march right into fire. I'm not afraid of any. What can happen? I can die. So what? He raised from the dead. What encouragement that had to be. And then the two on the road to Emmaus. And when they finally realized that it was a risen Savior who walked together with them along the way, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us? Well, he was expositing or opening up the Scripture to us. Wow. Hearts that were burning. Why? Because they knew it was the risen Lord. And as he showed himself his disciples, uh, to his disciples in that closed upper room that he really was Jesus risen from the dead, we read, they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement. They were incredulous. They believed, oh Lord, help my unbelief. Pinch me. This, am I dreaming? Is this for real? It is. 
And of course, there was Thomas, unfortunately, given the nickname of Doubting Thomas. When a week after missing Jesus' appearance to his disciples, when Thomas sees Jesus, all he can do is nothing other than, than utter, My Lord and my God. He believed. So it's abundantly obvious that Jesus' res- resurrection brought about unbounded hope into the hearts of his followers who were previously very fearful. And Timothy, Paul's beloved son in the faith, derived great hope from the resurrection. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, Paul told him. And we know that he was facing problems. And we know that his father in the faith was in prison. And so Paul encourages him. And and all it could cause Timothy to do is sing out, The Lord, if the Lord is for me, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Beloved, turn your focus to Jesus Christ, the risen one. And flee away from this crazy world that we live in with all of its fear-driven rhetoric. And remember and keep on remembering that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth like ID 2020 will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This is a simple yet profound truth that when you focus on the things of the Lord in his word, the fears and rumors and trembling that you feel looking at the things that are happening in the world, everything that makes you agitated and afraid fades away. I promise you that. It's true, it does. For when you turn your attention and your mind and you start to think about Jesus Christ, the risen one, and you involve yourself in prayer and the word of God, your fear and agitation and your anxiety will melt away and it will be replaced with peace and confidence. If it isn't, please call me. We've got other things we need to talk about then. If it fills you with anxiety, maybe he's drawing you to himself. Maybe you need to humble yourself before him, turn from your sin, and believe. And then your heart will be filled with peace. Because the mark of a believer is love and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness and goodness. That's what our lives are to emulate. Not agitation, fear, anxiety, depression. That's the world's stuff. Divorce yourself from the world. And Timothy, Paul says, I want you to to make this the habit of your life so that no matter what kind of persecution or trial or trouble you face, you will be equipped to stay strong, encouraged, and a faithful witness for Jesus Christ. And your heart will be calm, and your hands will be steady, and your feet will not stumble. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, Timothy. (laughs) If you're a child of God, let the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, infuse your hearts with this blessed hope. Thirdly, his resurrection ensures immortality. Jesus is the firstborn. He is the preeminent one out from the dead. Colossians 1.18 says this, He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. And in Revelation 1.5, Jesus Christ the faithful witness, is called the firstborn of the dead. The firstborn. Just yesterday I was out in our garden and I saw the tiniest little yellow daffodil. Okay? And it was the only one in the whole garden and it was the first fruit of an oncoming rush of yellow that will invade our entire garden soon. I know that because I've seen it happen every spring. Mary does a marvelous job with daffodils and all sorts of different colors. In fact, our garden goes from yellow, and then I believe it goes into white, and then it goes into a bluish hue, 
and she's got that all figured out at different blooming times in the, in the year. But this first little daffodil was the first indication that a marvelous show of lovely daffodils will populate our garden. I know it, it's coming, even with the snow that's snowing right now. They're peeking through that. In the same way, Jesus' resurrection is referred to as the first fruits of resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15.23. And therefore, it's a guarantee of a great harvest of resurrected lives which will follow. All who believe in him will be resurrected to eternal life. Jesus Christ is the first to rise from the dead. But there's a difference from those that he raised from the dead, like Lazarus and, and, and the widow's son. They all died again. Not Jesus, right? Not Jesus. He is the firstborn with a body that is no longer subject to death. He broke the mold. He broke the mold. Romans 6, 8-9 through 9 says this, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. The Bible says it so clearly. He's never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. And beloved, if you have the Spirit of God inside of you, that is the guarantee, the seal, that you will never see death. You might leave this shell, but this is not you. Thank goodness. <laughs> right? My real me has hair. <laughs> Think about it for a second. Vance Havner said, these eyes, that, that's not who I am. I, the real I, what's inside me, uses these eyes to see, uses this tongue to speak, uses these hands to feel. That's not the real me. The real me is inside using these things. And if we shuck off this temple, this body, this tent, we go to a resurrected body that is eternal. Immortality. And Jesus was the firstborn of that resurrected body. This is good news. This is great news. Revelation 1, 17 through 18. Jesus talking says, Don't be afraid. I am the first and I am the last, the living one. I love that. That's like, I'm living now and I will live forever. I am the living one, and I was dead. It's true. I did die. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I am alive forevermore. And, get this, I have the keys to death and Hades. I have the keys. Now, death and Hades refers to the same experience, but if you want to be really exacting with it and draw a line of distinction between the two, death is the condition, Hades is a place. It's like the grave. Death is what happens to us. And he says, I have the keys to death in Hades. In essence, to have the authority over what the keys lock or unlock, right? That's what it means when you have keys. I have a universal key for the church. I can unlock every door in the church. And that gives me authority. I can also lock all those doors. Jesus told John here, who was lying at his feet like a dead man, don't be afraid, John. I have the keys of death and the grave. I have the authority for who lives and who dies. There are very many people today because of COVID-19 that are very, very, very afraid. I don't want us to belittle that at all. For some, fear is almost overwhelming. It's consuming them. They sense there is no real way to protect themselves against the coronavirus, which is true. We have no protection against it. And they don't want to die. This is a very real fear, and it's a warranted fear because many who are so filled with fear do not know what to expect after death. And they're questioning that. They are and they have been living in the world, as, as Paul says in Ephesians, without God and without hope. And now they're finally confronted with the reality of their mortality, and it's causing them great fear. 
And now that they've come face to face with the prospect of their own mortality, they are scared to death. Well, the Bible says that death is a powerful enemy. That's why I say we should not belittle this. And may God use use this fear of death to lead them to eternal life. It might cause them to be overly concerned for their health, their diet, their need for exercise. The anxiety associated with the fear of death can actually enslave. You can become a slave to that fear. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 teaches us that. It says this, quote, Since then, the children share in flesh and blood, meaning humanity. He, Jesus himself, likewise also partook of the same. He became a man, the incarnation. And through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save those who are lost, those who are in slavery to their fear of death. He came to give us a way out through eternal life. Jesus won over death. That's why we say today, he is risen. Can I just say to anybody that's listening to my voice today, I don't know who's out there in, in uh, La La Land through this camera. I have no idea. I know that there are a lot of dear folks from Beacon of Hope, but I think people tune in too that just kind of find you on YouTube. And I'm talking to you. It's no mistake that you're listening to me right now. It's no mistake whatsoever. At this moment in time, when a completely unpredictable pandemic is raging across our globe and bringing sickness and death to so many, and I'm talking to some of the children that are listening to me on the TV set right now or on the computer, the children of parents from Beacon of Hope, you don't need to be afraid. As your pastor and as a pastor of Beacon of Hope, I want to tell you, you do not need to to be afraid because I can introduce you to someone who has the cure he has the cure he possesses a cure to every disease to pain and to misery that they cause and most importantly he has a cure for death and you can have a personal relationship with him and enjoy the all-encompassing protection Right now, you don't have to wait. You can enjoy it right now. I'm enjoying it right now. And I know many who are listening to me are enjoying that peace. That passes understanding. And you can have it right now today. I might say to you what Paul said to Timothy. Remember, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. You can just tell God right now, right here and right now, for real, how you feel. Just repeat after me these, these words. Seriously, if you're wanting to have that kind of peace and you don't have it, just repeat these words after me. God, I'm afraid of this virus and all the news that I'm hearing. I'm afraid of dying. And I know I'm a sinner because I've not lived in a way that honors you. Please forgive me, God. Please forgive me. I want to trust in you for the forgiveness of my sins right now. And I want to follow you with your help. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place and paying for my sins. Amen. You might have seen Franklin Graham on Fox News or on other TV stations saying, say this prayer after me. Preachers all over are doing this to help people because we know that you're afraid. You do not need to be afraid. That's your choice. There is another choice. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. This is the end of the story. Paul Harvey used to tell the rest of the story. This is the end of the story. I want to read it to you. And I'm going to begin in verse 3. 
This is written by Luke, who was the physician, the doctor. He also wrote the Gospel of Luke. But he wrote this account to a friend of his, Theophilus, and he tells Jesus' story in the beginning in, in the Gospel of Luke, and then he goes on and tells the rest of the story through the book of Acts. And in verse 3 he says, To these, these disciples, Jesus also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. So from the time that Jesus rose from the dead to this moment that I'm reading about right now in Acts, it's called the Ascension of Christ, it was 40 days. And gathering them together, he commanded them, gathering his disciples together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. What the Father had promised was the Holy Spirit, the other comforter. And remember, he said he had to go away so that the comforter could come. That's exactly what he's talking about here. And then he goes on, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Talking about the day of Pentecost. And so when they had come together, they were all together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now you understand Bible backgrounds, if you've listened to the preaching here for any length of time, the Jews, including his disciples, were all waiting for Messiah, and they were waiting for him to actually wrest Israel out of the hand of Rome. And so that's what they're talking about here. Is it now that you're going to bring the kingdom to bear? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Number one, the Father has fixed it. It's done. He knows when it's going to be. It's a sure thing. It's going to happen. <laughs> it's just Jesus is telling them, not now. That's not what this is about. He goes on to say, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So what Jesus is telling his disciples is, listen, stay in your lane do what I'm telling you to do. You don't have to worry about the kingdom, whether it's going to come now, later, whenever. Here's what you need to do. You need to be my witnesses. You need to tell people the gospel, the good news, what happened. I was crucified, I died, I was buried, and now I am resurrected to life everlasting. Go out everywhere to the uttermost parts of the earth and tell people that. That's what we're to be about, Christian. And just maybe the doors to the churches are all closed so that we might start doing that more effectively. And then verse 9, And after he had said these things, because it's done. In Matthew 28, it's called the Great Commission. He told them, Go on all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And don't forget, I am with you to the end of the age. I'm never going to leave your side. But here it says, and after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. What does it mean he was lifted up? It means his body, his physical body, that they had been interacting with for 40 days now. <laughs> he had been eating with them and talking with them and teaching them. His physical body raised up, ascended, if you will, and was caught up in a cloud and disappeared out of their sight. Now, that's amazing. <laughs> and I'm sure they were staggered, right? Just when they were getting comfortable with his resurrected body, he does this. And he goes out of their sight. And verse 10, And they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going. And behold, two men in white clothing stood beside him. Well, obviously, they're angels, right? And they're standing on the earth with the disciples that were watching Jesus' body ascend into heaven. And they said to the disciples, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Oh, is this hope or what? 
He is presently sitting at the right hand of the Father in a glorified body. And in that same body, he will return in the same way that he left. He will come in the clouds, we're taught. Believers, listen to me. I've talked to those who have not yet believed, and I've even said, repeat a prayer after me so that you might believe. This is for believers. Don't let the things in this world draw you away from his peace and the calm assurance that the living one promised. He said he will never leave you or forsake you and that he's with us even to the end of the age. It's not the end of the age yet. I don't know what next week's going to bring. I mean, look at what took place in two months. I I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't know if some of these far-out crazy rumors are going to come to pass. Maybe they will. So what? What difference does that bear on us, really, when it comes down to it? It doesn't. We have our marching orders. We're told to go out and be his witnesses. We're told to make disciples of all nations. We need to be about what he's told us to do. That's the message for us right here today. We haven't been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And that is the takeaway for everyone of us here today who loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid. Your testimony to a watching world right now, your relatives, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your testimony, your greatest testimony is your calm and your peace in the face of COVID. And might I add, your joy? Not a funky kind of fake, oh, praise Jesus. It'll all work out together. But a real serious joy people will know that you're not disturbed deeply by this as they are and it will cause them to say what's how can you be like this and then you can tell them i have confidence that jesus christ rose from the dead and so my confidence rests in him and so i'm calm because of that you're not denying the COVID. you're not denying the possible rumors that might come to pass. They they may, who knows? But it's not taking you captive. And that's a takeaway. Don't be afraid. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. He is risen. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Therefore, encourage one another with these simple words. He is risen. God bless you.